Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here today. We continue in our series, Things You Need to Know in the Epistle or the Letter of 1 John. Today's message title is Stages of Spiritual Growth. Stages of Spiritual Growth. But before we get to the message, I want to remind you once again about the purpose and the themes that are there in this epistle or letter called 1 John. Number one, uh, the purpose of the letter John clearly states to us in chapter 5 verse 13. When he wrote these words, he said, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This epistle was written to people like you and me that would read that would affirm their belief, placing their trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, that they know that they would know that there would be assurance that they know that they have, they possess at the moment of the reading eternal life. Not something in the future, but right now, if you believe in the person and work of Jesus Christ, his shed bloods atoning for your sins, you're bowing the knee, asking him to be Lord and Savior, that you know that you now, at this moment, possess eternal life. A theme that's in here, at the very beginning of the letter, comes out very clear with the word koinonia, or translated in the English, fellowship. We read these words at the beginning of his letter, Verse 3, he says, what we have seen and what we heard, we proclaim to you so that, that's a purpose statement, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And he goes on and says, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And then later on in verse 6, he said, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, this is a test, one of the many tests that are here in 1 John We know that we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But he says, if we walk in the light, verse 7, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship, again, that's four times this word koinonia, fellowship, has been represented in the first few verses of this letter. And so these two ideas, the theme of fellowship and the assurance of one's eternal destiny, are like two sides of a coin. You cannot have the assurance without the fellowship. And when we talk about fellowship, we're talking about a relationship, not a rules-oriented type of decorum or manner of living. It's not about legalism, as John's uh, contemporary Paul spoke about in Galatians. It's not about keep days and seasons and festivals and ceremonial rites. It's about knowing the right man, the God-man, Jesus, in a relationship, a personal relationship, a vibrant, living relationship. Not about knowing the Bible in head knowledge, but having a, an experience through a relationship with a man named Jesus Christ. And so we continue our series today. Paul has has given us, or excuse me, John has given us a a couple of examples of tests. He's given us doctrinal tests in chapter 1. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he the Son of God? Is he the resurrected one? As we talked about, the grave could not hold him, had no power over him. If if that's not part of your doctrinal or your teaching, your understanding of Jesus, you've got the wrong Jesus. Because the Jesus that's in this Bible, the grave could not hold And we'll never be able to hold. And anyone who believes in him, trusts him, the same will be true for you. That's eternal salvation. That's security. But there's also the moral test. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will not practice as a course of manner of living, as a habit of living, the things that are done in the darkness. We can think about Paul when he wrote the Ephesians and the Galatians and he talked about the things that are practiced in the darkness. He talked about the lewdness and idolatry, uh, the immorality, the bitterness, the backbiting. All of these things are to be put away in the Christian experience. Those are moral tests to see that if you are in the family of God. And John here for a minute in verses 12 and 13 and 14 seems to take uh, a break from these tests kind of like me every now and then I'll I'll get rolling on something and I'll say to myself time to take a breath it's time to leave the teaching and let's do some reassuring and John is doing that here 
when he begins chapter 2, verse 12, it's like he's got a parenthesis in the middle of a sentence or a paragraph. He's taking a break. He's leaving the main topic. Do you know who you are and whose you are? Do you know that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? He's leaving that topic for a minute, and he wants to give a word of encouragement, and he does it through this literary tool called a metaphor. A metaphor. And he's using a metaphor when he speaks of little children, young men, and fathers. He's taking what we see in the physical realm of natural development in the physical realm and he's applying it to the spiritual realm that's what a metaphor will do it'll take one thing and use as an example when it's really talking about something else so he opens this passage scripture and he gives three categories if you will broad categories and that's the three points of the message today point number one The humble beginning as little children. I wrote in my notes literally, the humble beginning, colon, as little children. Number two, the humble direction. The humble direction as young men. And number three, the humble conclusion as fathers. So you have a progression from little children to young men to fathers. And don't get hung up on this pejorative or this patriarchal language here. It applies to everyone, male and female. And so everyone will be encouraged today by this. So without further delay, please turn to 1 John chapter 2. We want to read verses 12, 13, and 14 together in God's Word. And as I see the pages stop flipping and the fingers start sliding, stop sliding, we'll read the Word of God together. John writing... Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says this, verse 12, I am writing you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has from the, been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray. Lord, today, as each has need, only as you can do, O Holy Spirit, speak and teach and apply this word to every life, everyone who hears this message today that Jesus would be glorified, and that we would be different leaving this place, hearing this message today. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The humble beginnings as little children. He says in verse 12, look there, I am writing you little children because your sins have been forgiven you for his namesake. Here's the, here's the hope, here's the encouragement in there, that if indeed you have been born again, that's literally what the word children here means. It's technia, and it's the word that means born ones. It, it, it harkens back to the conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus in John chapter 3 when he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And again, in verse 7, he says, unless you're born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. This idea, this is the same idea of being born from above, born from without, not being back in. Nicodemus said, can I go back into my mother's womb? And Jesus said, well, that's, of course, ludicrous. It'll never happen that way. What I'm talking about is a spiritual birth, a rebirth, a kindling of something that was old and dead like a seed. Now it has been revived with life. He says, you must be born again. And he says, I am writing to you little born ones. So he's talking about people that have been revived by the Holy Spirit, have been born again to newness of life through the work of Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit who brings life to every single one who bows the knee to Jesus. And again, and remember, this is a spiritual metaphor. He's, he's using this little ones in the physical realm to, to indicate these are little ones, meaning just born again. And it might be infants or young children here. And so these are really the beginning stages for every single person that can call themselves legitimate 
Christians. This is a starting point. Nobody starts off as a father or a young man. Nobody starts off as a mother or a young woman. We all start off as little children, born ones. And he goes on and he says, here's the hope that you know. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven. That's the first thing that you know when you hear the gospel, when somebody says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, is that you find yourself in the all category, which means you sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which means that you have a debt that you can't pay. But thanks be to Jesus Christ who paid that debt for you and that your sins have been forgiven. And that's not just the sins in the past. That's not just the sins of this present moment. But that is every single sin that you will ever commit has been forgiven. When God looks at your I guess you call it an accounting term. When he looks at your ledger sheet, what he sees is paid in full blood of Jesus. That's it. And he says that ought to be an encouragement to you that your sins have been forgiven. Now I want to do a little sidebar here for a minute. One of the troubling things that we experience as Christians is that we intellectually admit what was just read to us and what we just read. That little children, as little children, your sins have been forgiven you. But we have this thing called a memory, don't we? And we remember a whole lot of those things, don't we? And it's as if we feel sometimes we are enslaved or tormented by those memories of those things which we have committed, which we know were displeasing to God. Can I get a witness? Anybody here? We have to learn to put that down. Who, let me ask you, who would want you to think that way? Who would want to put that chain back on your leg, on your wrist? Who would want that for you? Our adversary. The evil one, Satan, the devil. He would want to literally put you on the sidelines of the game of the Christian walk. He would like to place you on the bench and make you a non-participant in, in the will of God for your life through guilt of the past sins or even the present thoughts or the thoughts of what's going to do and what you're going to do in the future that might be even inclined toward being sinful. Your sins, little children, have been forgiven you. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. That's the first thing that he wants to know, that these little ones should be encouraged that their sins have been forgiven them. But he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't leave that thought there because if you noticed in the passage, you have Children, fathers, young men, children, fathers, young men, all the way through this. He says something else about these children, the ones that have been born again. There's actually another class or another division that he speaks about next. Look there in verse 13, a little bit through verse 13. He says, after he talks about fathers, he says, I am writing to you, young men, who have overcome, and then he goes on, he says, I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. The last part of verse 13. I, and, and he uses a different word. And in the beginning, he used technion, which is the born ones. And then now he moves over to padia. Padia is the same word that's used elsewhere in the scripture that talks about the ones who are under instruction. You see, when, when you're an infant, for example... So, so we, have a classic, we have a classic case here, right here in the sanctuary. So we've got Bryson, the older, and we have Grayson, the younger. And we see Grayson is moved by emotions, environment. And, and he, he can swing from one way or another. He's like the technion. He's born, but all he knows is emotion. He knows hunger. He knows thirst. He knows rash. <laughs> he knows all kinds of things, but they're all feeling. He doesn't know not to put this thing or that thing in his mouth. Everything is filtered through the mouth, so to speak. And you're saying, no, 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 don't put that in the mouth. 
He needs instruction. And that's where the Padian comes on. He says, not only are you in this first category, you have this broad category of the born ones, but even in that subset of the born ones, you have the Padian, the ones who are under instruction. Literally, uh, I think it's, uh, we said it here, he says, whereas the Technion or little children are more regulated by their affections than their knowledge, that's true, right? Infants are, um, whatever they like, whatever their affections are geared toward, infants are going to go for it. If it's pretty and it's colorful, if it's got glitter on it or if it's got a ribbon or it's got a bow, their emotions are going to drive them toward those things. But he says it's not so with these ones, the Padian. These are affected by learning, by education, by training. And so we have Bryson. Bryson's getting to that point to where he's, he's getting learning, instruction from his parents, from his grandparents, from all those that are around him. He's learned. He might not be a Padian in, in the sense of he's in, in school, like six or seven years old, but he's learning. He's beginning to learn. And he's saying that all the ones that are born, there's a natural progression from infancy to this childhood where there's instruction. You come under the authority of another in order to gain knowledge. And so that's, that's the first section here. Of what Paul is saying, or excuse me, John is saying. He is saying that you should be encouraged, number one, that your sins are forgiven. Number two, to know that you are a child of God, the born one, that there is a progression from one place to another, from infancy to childhood. And he continues this line of thought. I'm just going to give you the information And then I'll come back and make some comments at the end about application of what these might mean for you and me. And so there's a humble progression through infancy into childhood to being the one who's trained in instruction. And then that takes form in in the second part, the humble direction as young men. Look at verse 13b, the center part there. He says, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. That's a pretty powerful statement. Now, we're not putting years on children and young men here today. It's just a broad category, remember. But he says, I am writing to you, young men. And he says something very curious about these young men. Because you have overcome the evil one. That's an interesting statement. I wonder how many of us would think that. None of us would probably verbalize it about ourselves. But how many of you would think, dare to think that statement about yourself, that you have overcome the evil one. Led me to ask this question. How is it that John would be able to write that these young men overcame the evil one? And it reminded me of a man that sat back here, just a little bit back behind Bruce and Sherry, maybe toward the center, named Sonny Waters. We used to have verse, we would stand around and quote verses to one another at one time in a church. And his, Mr. Sonny's favorite verse was 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved as God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. And then it goes on verse 16 and says this, But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And there will be talk that will spread like gangrene. Among them there are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they have upset some in the faith. Be diligent to present yourself. Presenting yourself for the purpose of knowing the word of God is precisely what Paul is getting there. He's telling young Timothy the instruction that you need to give every single padeon. You don't give instruction to to infants, the technion. But you give instruction to the Pateon, that way they can become young men, standing firm on the
the truth of God's word. So you have in the beginning, a humble beginning as little children. Then you have young men. They're young men because they are rooted and grounded in the word of God. It's like this. Look there at verse 14. He changes the verb tense from writing to written. But he says this. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And that the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome, he repeats it again, the evil one. How do you overcome the evil one? By the word of God. Knowing, believing, applying the word of God. John was at the river. Jesus approached. He greeted him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus says, baptize me. And he says, shall I baptize you, you who precede me? Baptize you. He says, let it be that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus came up out of the water and we hear a voice from heaven. This is my son and who I'm well pleased. And it says, like the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and rested upon him. And immediately after that, where does Jesus go? He goes to the desert. And he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And there he was tempted. As we have in Mar- or Luke 4 and Matthew 4. At least three times by the evil one. Comes to him and tempts him. And every single time. What did Jesus do? He replied. And the word of God says. And the word of God says. And the word of God says. The difference between the technion and the padilla is instruction. And the difference between instruction of the padilla and the young man is the word of God. That's why Peter wrote, I think it's in 2 Peter 2, 2, Therefore desire the pure milk of the word. As newborn babes, he says, desire the pure milk of the word. Like, like an a infant would crave sustenance and food we as young men as young women should crave the word of God to be instructed to be entrained David wrote Psalm 119 176 verses there's only like four verses that don't have some reference to a precept a principle or the law of God and he says your word has made me wiser than all of my instructors did you hear that I think I quoted Luke 6.40 a week or two ago. Uh, A a disciple or a pupil, when he is fully trained, will become like his master, Jesus said. Present thyself. Present thyself. Just like uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Present yourself. Verse 1, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. But then he says, be transformed, in verse 2, through the renewing of your mind. With what? National Geographic? No. The Word of God. This word strong here. He says, you've become strong. This uh, ikuris is what it is in Greek. And it's it's the strength that has been given to you from without. It's not something that you have made. It's not something that you developed. But it comes from the power of the Holy Spirit which resides in you. It's the same word you find in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 where it says, Paul says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his strength of his might. There it's translated as might. And he says, because of it's, it's the Lord's might... Guess what you have? He says, put on the full armor of God. Not the full armor of Bert. Not the full armor of Brian, uh, Smith, whoever. Put on the full armor of God. And he says, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You have infancy which is subjective to everything, the evil that could ever happen to it because it's pretty much defenseless. You have a pedian that's like a young child who's just learning, but then when you get to training and standing and being rooted and grounded in the Word of God, you should be a young man or you should be a young woman that cannot be led astray by the schemes of the evil one, by the false doctrines of this world. As a matter of fact, in verse 15, he's getting ready to say, don't fall in love with the world. Don't be in love with the world because the things of the world, they're passing away. Jesus said, not a jot or tittle will pass away from the world, but it will stand forever. 
Was it Psalms 40 verse 8? It says the flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of God will stand forever. Plant your feet on the rock. There's the metaphor again. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, there was a man that built a house on sand. There was a man that built a house on a rock. He said, the winds came with this one. The rains fell, and great was its destruction. But this one that was built on the rocks, it stood, it withstood, and it continued to stand. Young men are able to overcome the evil because they cannot be deceived by something that's false when they know what is true. The Secret Service has, uh, has the job of tracing all counterfeit currency in the United States economy. And they go around the world to find out what's counterfeit, how it's made, what's its origin, and to eliminate that. But you know what they don't study? They don't study the counterfeit. They spend more time looking at what is the real. That way when they see the counterfeit, they know the difference. We as Christians, as young men and young women, should spend more time in the Word of God. That when we see it on the television, we see it in the newspaper, when we see it in the magazine, when we hear it in conversations, we know what is true, what is false. And we're able to avoid it and we're not deceived any longer. And we overcome the evil one by knowing what is real and what is true. The last category. The humble conclusion as fathers. Two verses, part of verse 13, part of verse 14. Back up to verse 13. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. Verse 14, I, am, I have written you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. That's almost the exact same uh, language in the English as well as in the Greek. The verb tenses only change in you know and have known. What's the point here? I can look back in my life and I see a progression. I see a time when I was an infant and when I was a Padean. A technion and a pedian. I see a time when I could probably be called a young man. You see, young men have knowledge. But you know what knowledge needs? Knowledge needs wisdom. Fathers have experience. They have um, time. And, and, and when it's easy to become enamored as a young man with the word for the word's sake... Fathers become enamored with the father of the word. You see? The young men become enamored with the word. And fathers have come to know not just the word, but the man or the God of the word. And they've moved past the elemental and the basic things to the more personal and relational things. And they speak. And they walk and they talk, not with a book, not with just scripture, but they speak with God. They're relational with God. An example in the Old Testament, one of the greatest examples, one of the two examples of people who never tasted death was Enoch. It says, and he walked with God and he was not. Enoch was so personally and intimately involved with God that God took him before he tasted physical death. That's the ultimate picture of spiritual maturity in the temporal realm is that you walk with God. Not because he says to do it, because you're just with him in all things. Your mind is like him. Your thoughts are like him. And therefore, your actions, your words are his. Another example was Elijah. Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. The thing that's nice about Elijah is a whole lot more written about Elijah than was Enoch. 
We see uh, Elijah as being a spiritual leader in the Old Testament. We see Elijah as, you know, going to war and, and taking out 400 prophets of Baal, you know, there on Mount Carmel. We also see the vulnerability and the weakness of what it means to be a human in, that, in the days following that he was a man on the run because of Jezebel put the death warrant out on him. And so he was fearful, even though he was a great man of God. And so in this category of fathers, there's the, there's the ultimate, the penultimate, really, uh, of being like Enoch, walking so close with God that you're like hand in hand with him. And then there's this middle ground where Elijah is, or Elijah is at, where you're walking with God, but you see fault. You see fear. You see moments of lapse of faith. You see what we experience in ourselves. And then you have the transition from the young men to fathers. And so it's a little less like Elijah and certainly not like Enoch. And so we have the little babes, the infants, and then we have the children under instruction. Then we have the young men growing up in their knowledge. And then we see in, in the application of fatherhood there the wisdom in order to know what to do with the knowledge of God. And that is to be relational and intimate with him. And he's saying all of these things should be an encouragement to you, church, 2,000 years later at Lake Forest Baptist. Because if you've been born again, you're somewhere in one of those categories. There's safety and there's security in that. But there's also a challenge to know where you're at and to grow from where you're at. To know where you're at and to grow from where you're at. For every one that he knew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Meaning to be more like Jesus tomorrow than today. Not just a head knowledge. Not just a heart knowledge. But a relationship that is geared toward walking with God. Not keeping rules for rules sakes as young men will typically do. I see that in myself and those of you know my history here. I see that from 2004 all the way up to 2011. Knowledge applied indiscriminately without wisdom. Very hard black and white. Some of you are smiling. Nodding your heads. Maybe you've seen the transition. Maybe you who are new haven't. But trust me, I'm not the same Christian I was in 2002, 2010, 2015. Because just like you, there's a path that he's got for me to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 3.18, by the way. And you have a path. What happens, unfortunately, and, 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 and the, the critical truth today is that all of us are little children in one respect or another. The categories kind of get blurred from time to time because we all can be immature in certain areas. But then to know that we're little children, period, is an encouragement. To know that there's a progression of growth should be something that would encourage us to move on. And, and it's sad to say, however, that many remain little children for most of their Christian experience. They might have wisdom of the world, in the business world, the world of education, whatever the case might be, but they remain the technion or the padeon for most all of their Christian experience, and it should not be that way. Make no mistake, that's not an accident that one would remain a technion or a padeon. It's a lack of discernment and desire on that one's part. You see, God will take you as far as you want to go, as you desire to go with him. He'll meet you and walk with you every step of the way. His word will never fail. And neither will his plan. I don't believe in evolution, and that probably shouldn't be a surprise to any of you. 
But to explain some of the inconsistencies in evolution, scientists, so-called scientists, have coined this term, punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium explains the gaps in the theory of evolution where they see something moving along at a constant pace. Then for many, many years on their scales of years, they don't see anything happening in the world of evolution. But then they see something over here take up place and it changed from here to here. So there's a gap they need to explain. Punctuated equilibrium is that jump from here to here. God can operate in a system of punctuated equilibrium too. When he sees the technion not moving to the pedian, or he sees the pedian not moving to the young man, or the young man not moving to the father, he can, he can spur you on divinely by circumstance and situations that he will put in your path in order to make you grow up. That's why Hebrews 12 and 13 says, No discipline seems to be pleasant for the moment. The idea of the technion is not there, but it's there of the padion in Hebrews. It's not pleasant for the moment, but when you're trained by it, hear the word train? When you're instructed by it, when you learn the lessons that you need, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Make no mistake about it. If you are a technion or a padion or a young man and you're not in God's time frame, he might issue a, a, you know, a punctuated equilibrium on your life. And that might explain some of the things that you go through from time to time, folks. He's taken things away from my life that hindered my growth and walk with him. I wonder if you can say the same. I can look back and see three or four things in my life in the last 30 years that he's taken away from me that would have prevented me from growing to know and to love him and follow him. He can work with you like he did with Jonah. That's what I'm saying. You get it? Jonah was given a, an order. Jonah ran. Jonah got in trouble. Guess what Jonah did? He carried out the order. Don't, don't make that happen in your life. It should be encouraging. And so I'm going to stop right there. David said these words. I'm going to close after these words. Oh, how I love your law. It is the meditation, my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than all the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. You hear that? David was a great man, but he wasn't without flaw, was he? How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. For your precepts, from your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You want to grow? God wants to meet you. And it's going to begin with your desire. And it's going to be taking progress. It will happen not on your power, but his power which lives in you. Whether you're a technion, a pedion, a young man, or a young father in spiritual terms. I want to end with this question today. Where are you? Are you one of the little ones? Hallelujah. Are you the young man, young woman? Praise the Lord. Are you the father? A lot of us would run from that. We wouldn't want to think of ourselves as fathers or mothers. Remember that Paul had a mentor named Bartimus before he took on Titus and Timothy. We're all at different places. There's always somebody above you and always somebody below you. You can be a father at any stage to one of these, the technion, the pedion, the young man, or a young father. 
the biggie for today is not perfection, but direction. Where do you want to go? I'll be down front to talk with you if you have a question about your direction. Remember, it's about direction, not perfection. But you don't have a direction unless you know something else, and that means Jesus Christ. Until you've bowed the knee and accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is no little children for you. And the things that you need to know there is simply this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, who is all, everyone, myself included. That your sin has, has made a debt that's irreconcilable by anything that you would ever bring to account for it. But God, in his wisdom, sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. That if you would confess him with your mouth and believe in his heart, that, you, that, that he has been raised from the grave, that you would be saved. And that if you confess him before men, that he would confess you before the Father. And that you could be the technion. And it's my hope and prayer that you know that you know where you're at. And that you desire to grow in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ today. Come as you are. I'll be down front as the Holy Spirit moves. Let's all stand for our invitation hymn.